Hello folks, it's David here and I would just like to take a moment to ask you to go and check out our sponsors NordVPN. Internet security, very important. I'm sure it's something that you're concerned about as well. Me, I like to know that I'm the person in control of my data. I live on my phone and the amount of stuff I do on it from banking to documents to private messaging, I need to know is secure. We all know that there are bad people out there who will come in and uh, try and get our details and try and spend our money for us. NordVPN prevents that, especially if you're using public Wi-Fi's or you're using Wi-Fi's away from your home. If you use NordVPN, you are safe and protected. It also allows you to take short holidays to places if that's ever required. It's a brilliant product. I use it every day and highly recommend it. And you can get a tremendous offer if you go to nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand that's nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand or use the code heart and hand to get up to 70% off your nordvpn plan you'll also get one additional month for free risk free with nord it's 30 day back money uh, 30 day money back guarantee so all you need to do if you don't like it is just say nope and you'll get your money back so go and check them out as i say it's very important you'll get peace of mind Go to nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand. Hello everyone and welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast. My name is David Edgar, I'm your host as always and I'm joined this week with a lot to talk about by my good friend Colin McMillan. Good afternoon, evening, morning, whenever the listeners are listening to this, Colin. Hi David, yeah, good to speak to you um, on a momentous week really, I suppose. Yeah, lots to talk about and it's good to be on the show. Well, we've got the full range of emotions to go through on this show because of course, Thursday night, Rangers... I think it's not hyperbole to say one of our most impressive away performances in European football ever um, with the 4-2 demolition of Borussia Dortmund in the Signal Iduna, uh, formerly Westphal Stadion. A, a tremendous result, one that was an absolute head turner right across Europe. But we then came back home, uh, went up to Tannadice to play Dundee United and were held to a 1-1 draw, which meant that the gap at the top of the table extended to three points and really does leave us with no room for manoeuvre. Let's go in reverse order, Colin, because obviously our next match is against Borussia Dortmund, so we'll build up to that um, by looking at the first leg bef- uh, before we do that. But we'll start at Tannadice yesterday. Only the one change to the side. Um, and then came Philip Hellander for his first league start since recovering from injury. Uh, that meant that Calvin Bassey went to left back and Borna Barisic was put on the bench. Um, I actually thought Rangers started quite brightly in that opening 20 minutes. I thought we were on the front foot. We were getting at Dundee United. Uh, it didn't create enough, but the, the signs were there that, that Rangers were very much in the mood. Uh, then, of course, we know what happened. Rangers sort of came off it for about five, ten minutes, during which the United forced a succession of corners, one of which was headed home when Graham got Graham getting ahead of Philip Hellander to nod home from close range. After that, second half in particular, Rangers utterly dominant. Couldn't, though, get the winner. Got to go back. Joe Aribo, lovely goal. Apart from that, there were a number of misses, a number of very contentious refereeing decisions, which we will come to later on. But a very frustrating afternoon, um, as always, when Rangers drop points, uh, led to a lot of criticism from from fans. I, I'll start off with something that maybe is a little bit controversial. Colin. I'm not sure. The listeners, I'm sure, will let me know. But... I didn't think it was a bad performance yesterday. I think if it was a one-off game you were looking at, you would look at it as a bit of a freak result. Rangers really should have won that match. And, you know, playing like that most weeks would. It's not that I think that raised the ire of of fans. It's the fact that it's four away games now, uh, with no victories, three draws and and a defeat. It's the it's the context of the season that, understandably, people want to look at. Um, and while I would say out of those four matches, that's the first one I thought we were unlucky and we, sh- you know, we, we deserved more from the game. But it doesn't matter because the overall statistic is the only one that matters, and that's three points from twelve away 
uh, in 2022. It's a, a nine point swing at the top of the table. That's unacceptable. Yeah, it's, it's very much as that is the big issue for me because I do agree with you. I do think we played well yesterday. I think we played well almost to a man yesterday across the team. Um, there wasn't really MD, I think, that really let us down per se. It was just one of those days where we had, I think, I think we had 29 attempts on goal and we only scored one of them. We had, I think, one of the most amount of touches in the opponent's box I've ever seen and only scored one goal. And um, it, it was just a bad day at the office in the final third in that regard. But yeah, the, the story is, David, the, the away form and the swing it's led to in this championship race. And that is the issue for me. That's the that's the concern. It's the, the habitual now. It's become a bit of a habit, these last four away games and only getting three points from them. And that's the thing that has to just suddenly change. I'm not annoyed about dropping points yesterday because of the circumstances. That will happen in games like that. You will play as well as we did yesterday. You will get referee decisions coming against you. You will just not get any luck whatsoever. And that does happen in football. It's the fact that it comes on the ring on the run now of these four away games on the trot, which have been sandwiched in between a really great European result and some good home results, which is even more baffling because that tells you there's a little bit more to it than just a team that's not playing well because you can go to Dortmund and play like we did. You can play like we did at Ibrox against Hibs and against Hearts, but something's not quite right on the road. And that's the concerning thing because there's a hell of a lot more games on the road to come up uh, between now and the end of the season. And it, it needs to change now because like you alluded to earlier, I don't think we've got much more wriggle room left in this title race. I think we've got it to three points just now, which is still one game. As soon as it gets beyond that, that's when it starts getting a little bit out of reach and you're starting to look at all sorts of possible probabilities and this happening and that happening, and it just becomes a little bit messy and a little bit out of reach at that point. So, yeah, it is the issue for me is this away run and it needs to stop. Yeah, I I think you're right. I think most Rangers fans, well, would have been disappointed yesterday, would have understood it. I think, though, that it's very difficult uh, and probably pointless to separate that, that performance from the run of away form. Uh, I don't think it's in any way unfair to say, yeah, well, let's look at the last four since the winter break. That's a good, if you like, uh, middle point of the season. Um, you say, great, what we've done up to this point, fantastic, but now it's a new chapter and the chapter started badly away from home. There's no getting away from that. Uh, as I say, I think that I, I think the performances at Pataudry and uh, the Parkhead were abysmal. I really do. I think they were just two bad, bad performances. First one at, at Aberdeen just didn't get going at all. The one at Parkhead was just one of the worst 45 minutes you'll ever see a Rangers team put in. And Ross County, there was some good attacking play, but let down by some horrendous, horrendous defending Al McGregor, in particular having a, a howler. I want to talk about Alan McGregor because it's it's a difficult subject because you know, we love him. He's Alan McGregor. Uh, he's a hero and he's been one of the greatest Rangers goalkeepers of all time. And I must admit, after Hibs in the, the League Cup semi-final and the run of form he'd had up to that, I was beginning to think it's time for a change. He rolled back. I mean, he absolutely did. He rolled back. There's no getting away from that. He was brilliant. And I thought, well, that's, you know, shut my mouth. Uh, he showed me. But those doubts have crept back in over the last month. The goal we conceded yesterday is a goal we concede fairly often. And the reason for that is teams know that if they put an in-swinging corner into our box, the goalkeeper isn't coming for it. So, under normal circumstances, when you put an in-swinging corner into a team's box, the defensive team have the advantage because they've got two chances. One, a player will head it clear, two, the goalkeeper will come and take it. But that's reduced with Rangers. Then it becomes a straight contest because the goalkeeper won't come and take it under any circumstances. He just does not to do it. And instead, what will happen is it becomes then, can your defender? So a mistake from a defender and it's a goal. Um, his kicking, as we know, has never been a real strong point. Uh, he's passing. And is it time to say, probably still the best shot stopper we have? Uh, I don't I don't think that's arguable. But if you like, the three main areas of modern goalkeeping, command of box, shot stopping, and, uh, and kicking and playing out. And at the moment, I'd say McGregor's ahead on one and McLaughlin's ahead on two. And that, for me, would be why I would be thinking about putting John McLaughlin in because teams have clearly noticed this now, Colin. I mean, we all notice it. So the idea that teams with all the video analysis that's done in the modern game don't, 
the fact that we are conceding because a ball is swung right into the middle of the six yard box because they know that even at that short distance Alan McGregor is not going to come and take it so therefore if someone can get the jump on the defender and incidentally if anyone thinks I'm, I'm blaming Alan McGregor for the goal yesterday I'm not it was Philip Hellander's man he didn't do enough and he got out muscled for the ball uh, it, it, it's on him I'm just saying that would perhaps having a keeper keener to come off his line actually improve our chances of conceding less of these types of goals? It's, it's a really difficult conversation because it's almost... It's, it's not almost, what I enjoy. Um, it's not yeah. a conversation I enjoy having. I feel like I'm being disrespectful, <laughs> in, in yeah. all honesty, because of what Alan McGregor's done for us. Yeah, it's akin to treason, really, isn't it? Um, yeah. Having a go at Alan McGregor because he has so much credit in the bank. Um, he's been with us so long across the both spells and been so successful. Um, but your points you're making are all very, very valid ones. Um, we are we, this, the kind of goals that Al McGregor is so good at saving, the shots that he makes from distance, the kind of worldy sorts of saves. You don't get loads of chances like in a game against us. He's, there's, there's not as many of them for him to save. But these other ones that he's not doing the best and not coming out, they're becoming a lot more prevalent in games. And like you say, we're losing more and more goals to them. And we do have somebody in John McLaughlin who is a very, very able deputy. He is somebody that could come in. He is a number one goalkeeper at pretty much every other team in the league, I think. Yeah. And it's if this was any other position in the park where these issues were happening and these this was being identified and we were losing goals because of it, it would be swap he would be swapping them out straight away. The keep the goalkeeper's always a difficult one because managers are always kind of they don't like blaming a goalkeeper and taking them out for those reasons. It's always to, be, to rest them, maybe, never because of their own performances, because it seems such a hard road back for a keeper once that's been identified and they've been taken out for that. In terms of distribution and what he can do with the ball at his feet and actually playing the ball out and starting attacks, it's never been something he's good at. Al McGregor kicks the ball out and it tends to be a throw into the other team. That's just what it's been like for 20-odd years. Um, that's become such a huge part of the team, maybe a part of the game now keepers almost the whole sweeper keeper role and keepers being more involved in starting the attacks and coming out of their box and at 40 years of age you, he, he just cannot train Alan McGregor to do that David, he's not going to change it's not an area he's ever going to improve on so it's a case of either stick with what we've got and put up with those things because of what he does offer us and because of what he has in the past or are we bold are we treasonous <laughs> to, to go back to that phrase from earlier and bring somebody like John McLaughlin in it's such a difficult one, and I'm so glad it's not a decision I have to make. But if it's a decision that Gio does make, I think we can all see the reasons behind it and we might not all agree with it, but I think we probably understand it, at least to a certain extent, and we'd be able to see the pros and cons of the two goalkeepers. Um, I, John McLaughlin comes in and doesn't do a thing wrong any time he plays, does he? When's he ever no, let us down? No, I mean, that's that's it. Look, if we didn't have a, a good backup, then yeah, I would be... Yeah, I'd understand it. But... But as you say, I mean, I'm sure, and listen, folks, if you're listening to this and you think this is sacrilege, I get it. I really do. It's not something I feel, but I was delighted when Alan McGregor rolled back with that series of performances towards the tail end of uh, December. And I, I was like, brilliant. That's, you know, that's shown me. Um, I just worry because, like I say, it's clearly a thing now that teams are doing, right? Let's just put the ball there. And then I just feel that, that your odds of scoring against a keeper who doesn't come off his line are exponentially bigger. And even when they get into crossing positions now, they're putting it there all the time because they know that he is not going to come for it. And it's just not something that I see him being able to, to because a couple of times, as we know, he's come for crosses this season and it's ended up being being a goal. So, you know, I think that's his, his answer to that is, well, yeah, I could come off my line, but it, it's not something I feel particularly comfortable doing. Um, so we'll see on that one. The next player I want to talk about didn't actually start the game yesterday, came off the bench, and it leads to a slightly bigger topic of conversation. The That's Ahmad Diallo, who did not endear himself to the Rangers support yesterday. I think it's fair to say I was uh, a bit miffed myself, to, to put it mildly. And the reason for that is, one, he's elected to shoot when he's been put through on goal, when if he squares it, it's a tap-in for Fashion Sakala. He's hit the post. If you decide to take that on, you have to score. It's that simple, right? It's forgotten about if you put it away. It's really not if you don't. Uh, he absolutely had to square it, and he didn't. And, you know, in the end, that was probably the best chance for us to to take the lead and to win the match. Um, but it was two other things that are 
maybe very Scottish, but here we are Scottish, and it's the Scottish league we play, and I think we're allowed to to say that. One was a 50-50 that he completely bottled, and there's no you could see it. Uh, I've watched it back to see if I was being a bit unfair. I'm not. He sees that it's going to be a 50-50, and he deliberately makes sure he doesn't get there in time for it. Uh, and the other one, uh, of course, was when he was he thought he was offside, so he just stopped completely he wasn't offside um, and he should have played to the whistle uh i hate when scottish commentators are right but you know when even andy walker saying they tell you that at five years old that you play to the whistle and he's right you do you just keep going and if you get pulled back for being offside fair enough but go on and make the attack first um he hasn't featured much since he came in uh thought he had a good game he's opened a match against ross county contributed goal and an assist Parkhead, he was rotten, but I defended him then because he's not the first kid. He was let down by senior teammates and he's not the first kid to struggle in an old firm match uh, on his debut away from home. But yesterday, it, things like that are a long way back with football fans, particularly in Scotland. And Rangers played a, a bounce game today um, with a lot of players getting minutes against Brentford. He scored two goals in a 45-minute performance. Maybe a day late, uh, I think a few people will be, be suggesting. But he didn't he didn't endear himself at all to the Rangers support yesterday. He didn't, and he'd, he'd done such a good job, David, to endear himself in that first game with the goal and the assist. And I think we were all quite excited by him. I think most of us, get, like you, gave him the benefit of the doubt after Parkhead because of that game, which is the basket case of a game from all concerned. And it would be hard to hold that game just against him. But yeah, his minutes have been precious few and far between since. Yesterday, we got a bigger look at them than we've had in a while, and he just didn't impress. And the three things you called out are cardinal sins in our game that you just will not be forgiven for. The 50-50 one's probably the lesser of the three for me, just because of the stature of the guy and the size of him. I don't think he's going to win many 50-50s with the size of him, how thin he is and how small he is. It's not what he's really on the park to do, but... We've grown up watching this football club and seeing every player flying into these challenges because it's Rangers, that's what's expected. So he is going to get a hard time for that. The chance that he missed, um, if you're going to be greedy and go for glory, then you have to score. If there's any doubt about it and your team aren't winning and they're desperate to win, they're desperate for the points, you don't you don't go for glory, you just don't do it. You you square the ball um, and you pass it to um, Sakala and Sakala taps it in and we are having completely different conversations right now and we would have been for the last 24 hours as well. Um, but we're all still, we all still talk about how somebody should have passed it to Dodo, don't we? Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's It's not a new thing that happens. And the offside one is probably the one that got me most animated yesterday. I, went, I turned into my dad basically for five minutes when that happened yesterday in my living room. I, I couldn't believe that he stopped. I couldn't believe it when I saw the replays and saw how onside he actually was. Um, just given the circumstance of the game and what we were chasing and how intense we had played yesterday after and trying to get back into the game, to see him do that was as close to unforgivable as you get. Um, this is a boy, David, with bags and bags of talent. He's going to go on to do great things in the game. I've got no doubt about it. I just wonder if this loan and this league at the stage he's at is not going to do him really any of the favours that they thought it would and we're probably not going to see the best of him either, which is a shame because like you, I was quite excited by him coming the the price tag alone excites you, even though English money and stuff's right. crazy. It, it just excites it. you. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely, you can't help it um, if, if teams are playing that. There's obviously talent there. And I mean, there is there's talent there, but it's it's about showing it. And again, I think the worry with a chance like that is you're not playing for the team, you're playing for yourself. That's um, it. And that, you know, with a loan will get thrown at you anyway. No Aaron Ramsey yesterday, a minor injury. A further point, and again, things like this come up when we don't win, but that's the nature of Rangers. Uh, Diallo on the bench, no Aaron Ramsey yesterday, mine or not, will be fit for Thursday Um, both on paper good signings both on paper exciting and if they work fantastic you get all the praise for them but if they don't work if we get to the end of the season and neither of those players have made a contribution for whatever reason then people are going to be saying that was a bad transfer window, we clearly had a bad transfer window in the summer um, we didn't add any first teams in the window before that. Uh, and there are a lot of those players that have been here for a long time. Now, this could be premature. You know, both of these players could absolutely come back and play pivotal roles in a road to 56. 
And if that's the case, then the praise for them and for Ross Wilson will be fulsome. If they don't, though, it's more failure in the transfer market. And I have to say, I don't think our transfer business, certainly the last 18 months, you could argue longer, I know people will, but certainly the last 18 months, I don't think there's much debate. We have not added first team players to this squad. It really is that simple. And it looks like we are continually standing still and relying on players that have been about for a number of years, which is great. But as much as I love some of these players, I point blank refuse to believe that we can't find in three transfer windows anybody better to come in. Because if so, well, we should be winning everything, shouldn't we? Well, that's it. I think if you look across these last three transfer windows in particular, the biggest cheers to come out of them has been players signing new contracts or not leaving the club rather than new ones coming in, I think, from our point of view. I think we all expected to lose a real marquee player over these last couple of windows, and we haven't done. Nathan Patterson being the exception, but that's probably a very good shrewd move for us in the long run. Um, but yeah, we we haven't brought in any real game changers. We haven't brought AMD in that's became a first 11 um, automatic start, which is what you're looking for in these windows from at least one or two of the signings. The most recent winter window... I thought we were quite bold. I thought we were quite exciting in terms of going for Ramsey, in terms of going for Ahmad Diallo. We, we've brought in players from Juventus and Manchester United. And we've brought in players with bags of talent, uh, but with an injury issue. And well, are, with, are we guilty there of star fucking? Are well, we guilty there of going, oh, it's Manchester United and Juventus? And you're right, it's clearly, Aaron Ramsey is clearly exciting, but it, it, it's up to the people who make these decisions. It's up to Ross Wilson to say... Well, maybe that's not the best for us, though. And it's not his first window. No, it's not his first window. And as exciting as that window was, and we were all giddy as kites, high as kites that night. We're fans, we're allowed to be. Yeah, um, Yeah. and as exciting as it was and as wonderful it was, would that perhaps a more contained transfer window and a little bit less glamorous one where we spend the money and bring somebody like Suter in and do that, have a better impact on the team overall and give us a better chance of the title? That's the question at the end of the season that will be answered, whether doing something a little bit more sensible and spending the money that way rather than the glory signing or the exciting ones. Because at the minute, we've brought in Aaron Ramsey, brought in Diallo, and we could have done without them so far. Um, yeah. Neither of them have really done anything that we, the rest of the team couldn't have picked up, picked up the strain and done for us. That might change between now and the end of the season. I hope to God it does, because there's a lot resting on it. But at the minute, we've not got anything from either of them. Would John Souter have headed that ball away yesterday? Potentially. Um, we don't know. But that's the, maybe the sort of sign we should have looked at something a little bit more standard, a little bit more obvious, rather than the, the marquee balls out signings that we saw at the end of that transfer window. I, I Look, I, I really want to be coming back here in three months going, superb bits of business. Absolutely amazing. Totally you know, turned out to be game changer. I'd love to do that. But the jury is out at the moment and the clock is still ticking. So we'll have to wait and see that. We'll answer that. The referee, Colin. Now, the big debate is around VAR in Scotland. There's no VAR. And I think the, the contrast in the last two matches have shown what, what happens when you have VAR. Rangers got two decisions on Thursday night, penalty that was a penalty that had been missed by the referee. And then a bizarrely <laughs> um, disallowed goal. I have no idea what the linesman was thinking he saw at that point because it was never in, in a million years even close to offside but even so he put his flag up and VAR said oh you're, you're crazy he's, he's well on side and, and the goal was, was allowed to stand and that's you know what it's for and of course yesterday we, we see two one a handball which is a penalty I mean it is nobody from this podcast came on after Aberdeen and said it's not a penalty against Morelos we don't like the rule we think it's harsh um, collectively I know that speaking to all you guys speak to our listeners none of us particularly like this idea um, of completely accidental handballs being given as penalties but we accepted it we said that's the rule it hit Alfie on the hand it's a penalty and nobody you know, complained about it. Yesterday's the exact same. Boy's got his arm up by side. He, well, he's trying to move it out the road. He is, but he's got it up by his side and it hits him on the arm from a fair distance. It's a penalty not given. And then the second one, the, the really unforgivable one, was Sakala's about to tap the ball into the net. He gets pulled back by the by the shot, losing his balance. 
it's a penalty and it is a red card. I know some people saying with the the double jeopardy rule, that doesn't apply if you don't try to make a tackle. You don't get sent off if it's an honest attempt at the ball, but for a pull or a push when you have no intent, it's just a cynical, then it's a straight red. So the United would have been down to 10 men, Rangers should have had a penalty. The thing about VAR is, in these debates, that we seem to be moving to a point now where people are saying, uh, and in the media saying, ah, well, we don't have VAR, so this will happen. And I don't think that that is the right way to look at it, because what we seem to be doing is excusing the fact that our referees are so poor and make so many bad decisions and say, ah, well, we don't have VAR. And I don't, I don't think that's an excuse. I don't think that you can just hold your hands up and say we all have to accept this pathetic level, this pathetic standard, because we don't have VAR. We don't have VAR. We should have, but we don't. That doesn't mean these referees are allowed to go out and guess and miss things and just, you know, I, I banged on about this before. They're well paid for a part-time gig, and it's the same thing all the time. And it's frustrating because. As Rangers fans, we feel a lot of decisions go against us. I think that's a legitimate complaint. I've said this before. It's been something that we've seen for years and years because these are human beings. I understand it. That they give the benefit of the doubt in decisions to Celtic that they don't give to us because they know that a decision given against Celtic is a week in the paper, new windows, having to change your phone number, whereas a decision against Rangers... It's fine. And a decision for Rangers is new windows, having to change your phone number, all of that. For Madden to miss both of them yesterday was just horrendous. Uh, There's a red card tackle in the first half as well on Scott Arfield that we didn't even see a booking for. Uh, And of all the poor decisions yesterday, the one that we're being told is going to be looked at by the compliance officer is a tackle by Ryan Jack. I think it's a perfectly legitimate thing for Rangers fans to be upset about. It is like it's almost every single week, David. There's a referee decision that we are questioning, and a big one. Yeah, a big one, a game-changing one, one that leads to a goal or a penalty, or us conceding a goal or a penalty. There's there's something there most weeks, and VAR isn't something that's going to come in and suddenly make our referees all purely to be Kalina overnight. No, it's not going to do that. But what it is it's going to give them support? It's going to give them something to have a look at, and it's going to make them better at making the decision because they can have a, they can have another look at it and double check it. So I'm all for it. I would install it tomorrow. But you're right, that doesn't mean that we just accept the referees as they are. They've got, they will have VAR soon and that'll be fine. There's still work to be done with these referees in terms of training them. We need to look at some way of getting a bank of them and making them full time so that the refereeing is actually their job and it's what they do and it's what they study, it's what they learn. These guys can't just come in and run about for two hours on a Saturday or a Sunday refereeing the game, then that's them out of it. No, no nothing more to do with refereeing until the next match. There needs to be more to it, they need to be more accountable. There needs to be some sort of, I'm not saying there should be a league, a league table for referees or something like that, but it just seems to me that a referee makes a mistake, they might not get a Rangers or a Celtic game for another week, and then they're right back in amongst it again a week, two weeks down the line. It, there doesn't ever seem to be any consequences for poor performance, and I don't know, if David, if that's because there's so few referees coming through the ranks in this country now that they literally can't replace them because there's not exactly a, a bank of them ready to come in and replace the current ones that are so poor. But we need to do something about training them, getting them to a higher standard, making it a proper gig that they actually do and get them the help and the support that they need as well. And one of them is VAR. There shouldn't be, it shouldn't be cost restrictive. It shouldn't be anything that stops us having that. I heard yesterday from one of the podders, Andy, that the Israeli league -league with three and 4,000 seater capacity stadiums has got it. So there really is no excuse for Scotland with the TV deal we've got not to have VAR. It's, it needs to change, it needs to come in and a, a, an important thing to note about VAR is I don't think VAR is suddenly going to change our fortunes automatically I think we'll lose out to VAR just as often as we gain from we it, will. but it'll be will. consistent and it'll be fair and me and you'll be able to have conversations most weeks about the game and about goals and about players and not about referees and that's what we all want Couldn't, couldn't agree more mate, couldn't agree more with that How's a free case of beer sound? After, uh, let's face it, the longest January in record and off the back of some pretty testing times, I reckon it sounds good. Let's face it, we all deserve a party and, uh, well, 
a case of free beer will help that get going. And you can get a case of free beer from our pals at Beer52 by going to www.beer52.com forward slash heart and covering the postage, which is just 5 95 It's the biggest beer club in the world. Each month they send members a case of beer from different parts of the world, and this month it's an absolute belter. It's the Great European Road Trip case, and... Uh, who knows more about great European road trips than the Jairs. We're just coming back from one right now. You can have a, a Chris Pilsner from Norway's Lervig Brewery and a Monster 7.5% double IPA from Sweden's Duges Brewery. On the dark side of beers this month, there's a smooth coffee stout from Copenhagen's Tool and there's also beer from Croatia, Poland, Germany, Serbia and Austria. If dark beer's not your thing, you can choose the light only case and as always with Beer 52, you get the Ferment magazine, some snacks to soak it up and even if you don't like it after that you can just cancel at any time so go to www.beer52 forward dot com forward slash heart to claim your free case now that's beer52.com forward slash heart well then on to um thursday night and the previous thursday night of course um, rangers taking on borussia dortmund and I was in Germany, and I'll be honest, Colin, when I was going over, I didn't really have a huge sense of nerves because I didn't have much in the way of expectations. And I think that, you know, we'd got out of the group stage. The draw wasn't fantastic to us. You know, Borussia Dortmund, do you think? And my ambitions were pretty much keep it alive. There's a full house at Ibrox next week. Let's not, who've paid big money, by the way, you know, almost £50 a ticket to go to this match. Um let, let's not get taunt three or four, um, and it's just a, a friendly, basically. Let's uh, you know do our best to to stay in the match, and if they'd done that, I, I'd probably have been content enough. And what happened will stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, it, it was genuinely, inc- I think I was actually high at, at some points during that match, like genuinely. I've been high a lot in my life, but um, this was a natural one. Uh, I've got a photograph of the scoreboard at 2-0. I've got a photograph of the scoreboard at 3-0, at 4-1 <laughs> and at 4-2 because all of those were things that could not happen in reality. And yet Rangers went there and it wasn't a smash and grab. Rangers were the better team all over the park. Rangers were dominant and to the point where the Dortmund fans, there's a great video of them up applauding after the third goal. Um, very unhappy with their own team, but they knew it wasn't bad luck or, you know, uh, they'd been unfortunate. The Rangers went to Dortmund and played them off the part. Now, no away goals, obviously, is a factor um, that, that, that hurts us. But we do have a 2-0 lead, if you like. We start the game against Borussia Dortmund on Thursday in front of a packed Ibrox at 2-0 up. And look, while the disappointment from yesterday is tangible, and incidentally, regardless what happens on Thursday night, we've got a game against Motherwell that's hugely important on Sunday. All of that is true, but this is an opportunity to knock out Borussia Dortmund, the second best team in Germany. This is an opportunity to do that for me, this is enormous because it's something that no matter what happens the rest of the season, we will be able to look back on in years to come and, and point to as one of our finest European hours. And like I say, we kick off that game two goals up on, on Thursday. I believe that we can do it. I believe that we should do it. Um, but then again, there are Dortmund players and fans that are quite confident they'll be able to turn it round and let's face it, the talent they have, they have. I mean, it couldn't be set any better. First, it was a special, special night, David. Um, because of the result, because of the way we played to get the result and because of what it, what it meant and because we didn't expect it. Um, so similar to yourself, I just wanted the, the game at Ibrox to not be a dead rubber. I just wanted us to still have a chance. Um, even having that chance at Ibrox, I still thought we wouldn't be enough and we'd go out because it's Borussia Dortmund. They spent some like 250 million euros in the last two years, um, but I just wanted us to keep ourselves in it with a chance. But we went out there and we played so so well. It, it was extraordinary at times. I was watching it and couldn't believe what I was seeing. Um, I actually, a tear in my at the fourth goal. Um, I don't get emotional like that watching football really, but literally my eye glazed over at the fourth goal because I just couldn't believe what was happening, and I didn't think I'd ever be in this position watching Rangers playing teams like. Borussia Dortmund did scoring four goals away from home. It's just remarkable. Um, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. 
we've put ourselves in a really really good position um, coming up coming up to Thursday. Um, fifty thousand full seat or stay, full capacity stadium. It's going to be wild. It's going to be a cauldron of noise and. Dortmund will be used to that. They, they get that at their home games all the time. They're famous for it. So I don't think it will scare them too much. But I think it will it will power our team on, starting with a 2-0 head start. It's 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 written in the stars now to, to go through because of, because of the position we put ourselves in. Um, Dortmund are capable. We saw that. We saw they could get goals from nothing, cracking goals from outside the box, and they can turn the game on its head just like that. But if we are sensible and we play the way we know we can play, then there's absolutely no reason why... We don't go through, and given the atmosphere, given the size of the, the the game, the magnitude of it all, I don't see us not scoring on Thursday night. And Defen- Defensively, we need to be very switched on. You're spot on there, yeah. right? But I don't think that we can retreat back and sit. No, uh, we didn't do that on Thursday, and you're right. The the weakest point of this Dortmund side by a mile is that defence. Not even close. They, they beat Borussia Mönchengladbach 6-0 at the weekend, by the way, folks. I think an angry reaction um, to that. We know their attacking talent, and it, it's ludicrous. You know, Marco Royce, you know, Julian Brandt, Jude Bellingham, Rafael Guerrero. These are top, top class, Champions League level players. We know that. But if we sit in and try and hold on a 2-0, then the chances are, with, it, with that talent, they'll break us down. If, though, we make sure. No, we'll have to defend at times. There's no doubt about that. It's all right saying this, but it's not like it's through choice that you get forced back by a good team. But we've got to attack the way we did on Thursday night with belief, with drive, with skill. Um, they have different problems now that they didn't think. I'm sure that they would have to be sitting having a pre-match meeting ahead of Thursday, saying, "What are we going to do about Ryan Kent?" So you know, we've got players who are in their head. Alfie, another one. Um, and you're right, we've, we've got to be front foot, we've got to go and make sure that we that we deliver a quality attack and performance. Be sensible, I'm not saying that we go out and completely, you know, all guns blazing at the start, we don't need to, it would be silly to do that, but I suspect they're going to at the start, which will leave space for us to exploit. Yeah, and that's what we, we, we play well when teams come at us. That plays into how well our team's played over the years, particularly in Europe. So it's, it's, the thought of Borussia Dortmund going full pelt at you is a scary thought, but us then counter-attacking that against their defence is equally quite pleasant. So it's going to be a cracking night, David. It's going to be a cracking game, I think. I just... I don't want to say I'm confident, because how can you go from thinking the ties you've got no chance to them being confident going to the next one and thinking you're through? But I'm almost guilty of a mile in the next round already. Well, and, um, I, I don't think it's done. I mean, I really don't. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion at all. Right? I think we will need to be very much on a metal, and it might be a bit of a tense night. I think we'll need to, as, as a support, make sure that, that we stay with the team you know, for the 90, maybe even 120 minutes. But I do believe that we're more than capable of scoring against them. We've proved that we are. Um, I don't think in a week they're going to be significantly better defensively. Uh, that. I would always have agreed with your point that we're better than when teams come out against us, but then you just need to look at Parkhead where Celtic swamped us and we, I mean, we were awful, genuinely awful, but even so, that's what can happen when a team swamps you. There's plenty of space to play at Parkhead, but we never exploited it once, you know, the whole 90 minutes because Kent was miles off it, Diallo was a non-factor, the fullbacks didn't contribute. That's what we need the guys to do and and to play with confidence because as I say they've shown they went to Germany and played with confidence and I and I want to see that delivered on Thursday night. If we're in any way caught between two stools, which we, we know can happen, where you go, do we defend what we have? Do we go forward? And you end up doing neither. That is what I don't want to see. Have the courage of your convictions, have confidence that you can go out and play the way you want to play and be good enough to to overcome this challenge. David, with uh, just first day, my question for you: um, Where where would you put this tie up against? If you if you think about kind of recent memories, so let's look at Parma, let's look at Leon away, and let's look at the, the semi in Florence. Would you say if we go through, it's it's up there with them, bigger than that? Because the, the probably the gulf between the two teams now is never bigger, with from a financial point of view. Um, I, I don't think we can underestimate how big a deal it is to go over to Germany and win and potentially go through. Oh look, it's it's enormous. If we were to knock Dortmund out, then it's to me it's it's up there with Parma, um, and it's better than Leon for the following factors. One, Leon was a one-off game, 
And of course, you know, we lost 3-0 at home to them at Ibrox. Uh, and, and it was a group stage match. Uh, and I think that as impressive as that win was against Leon, who were a top side, that it was a bit of a smash and grab, which is fine. You know, we had to do it. The semi-final's a big one because that was just sheer heart and balls um, that night from that team. That was what rating, you know, and, and to do it in the penalty shootout in that atmosphere was was just incredible. But for me, it would be up there with Parma. And the reason I say that is that that Parma side was ludicrous. I mean, the yeah. names, you know, Buffon, Churam, Cannavaro, Ortega, world, world-class players. But we were a lot, stronger in terms of if you look at our team that night and the money spent on it so I think that the financial gulf brings that up a little bit um, it, it would certainly be out there. as a one-off game it's up there as I say with Leon for me um, but if we were to actually do it over two legs, Scottish teams are not supposed to knock out you know, one, of the top two, one of the top two teams in Germany. We're, we're just we're not supposed to do that, especially in this era of football. So I think that the it would be up there if we could do that. Um, we'll always enjoy looking back on that night. It was a sensational night, but it does count for nothing other than just you know a pleasant memory. If we don't finish the tie off now. Yeah, it dilutes it massively in your memory. Yeah, of course it does. Of course it does, because then you know, in years to come, we'll all look back on it and go, what a performance, what a night. Uh, that It's already hit that status. It's already iconic. But you're right, if we were to then get through it and go to the last 16, then it's it's huge for us. It's absolutely enormous. The key thing for me as well is that we can take our eye off Sunday against Motherwell, but nor can we look ahead to it at this point. We've got to go a game at a time. I don't think they took their eye off the game yesterday, by the way. Um, no. I don't. I think they just, you know, were a bit unlucky. Uh, as you said at the start, you know, a few things went against us. But, it, you know, because of the way that it's gone, that you mentioned at the start, we can't afford to drop any more points. We certainly cannot drop points at home. That is you know, unforgivable and the reaction from the fans would be absolutely enormous if we were to do so. So I just think that you need to prepare for Thursday night to Thursday night. Let's let's make sure we get the job done and then on Friday morning we wake up and we go, right, Sunday. You know, to me that that is absolutely crucial. I think that we are at game to game stage of the season. Uh and I, I think that we've got to to focus on what matters and what's important. A victory against Dortmund, as you say, for you know, for PR is enormous in terms of uh, the club's reputation worldwide. In terms of for us as fans, is enormous, but financially it's huge as well. It's millions of pounds for getting through it the next round, and I think that that's that's very much <laughs> that should be enough of a carrot. And then if we get through it, we need to take that good form into Sunday. If we don't get through it, we need to do what Dortmund did and react angrily. Yeah, that's it. It should, it should always be a positive after a, a night like that rather than the negative because it just brings everything down. And if you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with something like Borussia Dortmund, you should have absolutely no fears about facing them day in this league. And um, like you, I don't think that was the problem this weekend. I think we just had a bad day with bad luck. It wasn't a, it wasn't a form thing. It wasn't the players. It was just a bad, bad day at the office uh, yesterday against Dundee United. Uh, next week against Motherwell. It just needs to be three points. It, it, we just cannot. The, the, the idea of not getting those three points against Motherwell, regardless of what happens on first night, it's just unthinkable. No, it is. And uh, I don't think we're being unrealistic to uh, to to hope, uh, expect, and even demand that Rangers are capable of producing two performances in these next matches. And then see after, see if they beat Motherwell, and see if they knock out Dortmund, beat Motherwell on, on, on Sunday. It will still be us next Monday going right, St Johnson next. Yeah. That's the business end of the season at a top club, and that's the pressure that the players need to respond to. So a strange week, uh, the highest of highs, and then a, a real huge disappointment, but really still everything to play for. And I, I do mean that, you know, really still everything to play for. And I know that if you go on social media, the bloodletting that goes on after a disappointment yesterday, there's, there's you know, people running up the white flag already. That's the league gone. No, it isn't. Right, I'm, I, like you might be right. We might not win it, but to say right now we're not going to win it is is ridiculously premature. I, I never really understand that way of thinking. That I'm going to say this now, so that if it gets to the end of the season and I was right, I can say, well, I was right. 
well, yeah, I might be wrong. I, I might be. I don't know what's going to happen. And here's the thing. Our opinions do not influence what happens on that field. So it doesn't matter that I believe we'll win the league and other people don't. It doesn't matter that I believe we'll knock Dortmund out and other people don't. It's what the players do. And I tend to react to what's happening rather than think about what might happen. And as we mentioned earlier, the season could go two ways, Colin. It could be glory, glory everlasting. Or it could be at the end of the season, look at all these mistakes you made. We need to talk about people's positions at the club. I think that's a perfectly reasonable view to have. It is, and listen, this, we're in a title race, David. We're in a title race that a lot of people aren't familiar with because it's been a long time since we've been in one because we ran away with it last season. There was no title race. The title races fell apart at Christmas a couple of seasons before that, and we all know it went on for a decade before that. So it, this is maybe a either forgotten territory or unknown territory for some people, but this is how a title race looks like. There is swings and roundabouts. There is good results and bad results and there's still a hell of a lot of football to play and it is still in our hands to win 56. And like you, I do think we're going to do it. Um, And also like you, that means nothing. But I'm confident. I'm looking forward to the rest of the season and um, I still think we can do it. Colin, thank you very, very much for joining me today here on the uh, flagship show here on Heart and Hand. If you want to hear more from me and from Colin and from all the other podders, uh, then go to patreon.com forward slash Heart and Hand, where you'll get up to five shows every single day covering all things Rangers and all things football from just £1.50 per month. That's month, not week. Uh, so it's the best value on the internet, let me assure you. Um, I'll be back next uh, next Monday to discuss what happened against Dortmund and against Motherwell and until then I'd just like to thank our executive producers in London Mike Lee and Paul Myers and to wish everybody going to Ibrox on Thursday night a very very special evening it could be one for the ages thanks for listening folks I'll talk to you again soon bye bye <laughs>